Hello, my name is Aiden Rupert, alongside me, Rob Murray, and welcome to episode two of our brand new podcast series, the WCHT Sports Podcast, where we discuss the latest news and updates from around the sports world. Today's episode is brought to you once again by our WCHT Sports 88.1 FM YouTube page, where you can expect weekly updates on all things sports. Today, we'll be talking about the top performances from week one of the NBA restart, as well as our playoff seating and awards predictions. Following that, we'll touch upon the NHL's return, which features a unique playoff format, as well as discuss MLB's surprises and standouts as the league continues to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. Should be a good episode, Rob. Sure will, and it's great to be back, Aiden. This was really the first week we got to see a number of sports back in action, and it's got me very excited for what's ahead. But first, before we get into the games themselves, we want to shout out you, the listener, for your support of WCHC Sports on Instagram. Over the past week, our Instagram following has increased by 100%, and we are just getting started. Stay tuned to WCHC underscore sports on Instagram, as well as our Twitter and Facebook accounts for updates on the podcast, as well as Holy Cross Athletics. So now, Rob, we've got over a whole week of NBA basketball under our belt. So let's talk standouts. And what better way to start than by mentioning the outstanding play of Indiana Pacers forward T.J. Warren, who on Saturday put up a career-high 53 points on 20 of 29 shooting, 9 of 12 shooting from three in a 127-121 win over the Philadelphia 76ers. And T.J. Warren wasn't done there. He followed up his career-high performance with 34 and 32-point games, both Pacer victories. And TJ Warren has been the surprising star of the Orlando bubble so far. And what I'm looking forward to is the upcoming rivalry matchup with Jimmy Butler of the Miami Heat, assuming Butler's healthy from a minor foot injury. And this game on Monday would feature a lot of bad blood between these two competitors as Butler, back in January you might remember, called Warren trash, insisted he was not in his league, called Warren soft, and even took the beef to Instagram after the game. And as much as I personally love Jimmy Butler, it is worth noting that TJ Warren has now matched Butler's career high of 53 points. So this one Monday should be a great matchup. Absolutely. And sticking on the topic of players who clearly are not trash, Mavericks guard Luka Doncic had a brilliant all-around performance on Tuesday night against the Kings. He went for 34 points, 20 rebounds, 12 assists, and a 114-110 win. Very impressive performance from a guard like Doncic. He's the youngest player ever to record 30-20-10 at 21 years old, undercutting the great Oscar Robertson in 1961, who was just 23 at the time. And again, sticking on the topic of players who are clearly not trash and on one of the NBA's premier young players, how about Devin Booker on Tuesday against the LA Clippers? He put up 35 points and most importantly was a game winner at the buzzer right over Paul George. He had Kawhi Leonard on him, got switched on, or PG got switched on to him and he knocked down the shot. I thought he even got fouled, but the Suns won 117-115 and are now 4-0 and in the NBA restart. And as we record this, Rob, the only other undefeated team in the Orlando bubble, the Toronto Raptors, are in some trouble against the Boston Celtics. So props to the Phoenix Suns on their 4-0 start in the restart. Yeah, the Suns, like the Blazers, a team that we'll get into a little bit later in the podcast, are looking very dangerous to the Memphis Grizzlies for that eighth and final seed in the West. Now, it's important to remember the small caveat that the ninth seed in the West will get to challenge the eighth seed for that last playoff spot and the right to, of course, get swept by the Lakers in the first round. But it'll be very interesting to see um, a competitive three or four team race um, as the bubbles final games draw to a close. And Rob, what about Charles Barkley? Charles Barkley continues to double down on his take that the Portland Trailblazers would beat the Los Angeles Lakers in a first round series. Um, I definitely have a gripe with that. We'll, we'll get to that spot if we need to, but for now, you know, let's talk about Michael Porter Jr. He was mentioned uh, last episode as a potential contributor for Denver. Uh, and he's been excellent filling in for some injured starters on that team. The last three games for the Nuggets, he's tallied 37 points, 12 rebounds, 
30 points and 15 rebounds on 27 points and another 12 rebounds. So it really seems like the former highly tattered prospect uh, out of Missouri is ready to come into his own as not only a very solid player, but even a potential superstar down the line. Well, definitely, Rob. And not to toot my own horn, but there really is a reason that I mentioned him in talking about Denver as a sleeper team last week. He was a big-time high school recruit and obviously dealt with injuries in his lone college season. But three straight 30-point games, or that last game being 27 points, he's really showing why he can contribute. Whereas Bol Bol, the other player I mentioned, is unfortunately being posterized by Yusuf Nurkic of the Portland Trailblazers. But, that. <laughs> so lastly... Just a couple of days ago on Wednesday, Chris Paul and the Oklahoma City Thunder straight up embarrassed LeBron James and the Lakers in a 105-86 victory. And it was a very weak showing for the number one seed Lakers and perhaps a testament to just how OKC is still being overlooked this late in the season. And we talked about the Blazers, but the Thunder could be a very dangerous first round opponent themselves. And the Lakers, meanwhile, are just two and three in the restart and LeBron recently suggested in an interview that the team is dealing with some, quote, off-the-court issues that are outside of the player's control, yet James refused to elaborate on these comments. But let's not let any of that take away from the great showing from the Thunder on Wednesday and the great team win over the Los Angeles Lakers. So now, now that we highlighted a few of the top performers from the first week to week and a half of NBA action, how about the playoffs? They're just around the corner beginning in just another week and a half from now. So talking about how the playoff field will shake out with the final regular season game next Friday, here's what I see out East. I think that we know what eight teams are going to make the East. In fact, we do know that. The Washington Wizards, though not technically statistically eliminated yet, they are all but out of reach of that eighth and final playoff spot. And out east, Milwaukee is officially locked up the number one seed. So I foresee them taking on Brooklyn in that first round. Brooklyn really, they haven't been bad in the bubble. I believe they're three and two on the restart, um, but they are down so many players. You talk about Kyrie and KD, obviously. We knew that they weren't going to be playing, but then Spencer Dinwiddie, DeAndre Jordan, Wilson Chandler, all of these contributors – they're not present for Brooklyn, so I see Brooklyn slipping a bit, as great as they have been. Number two, I see Toronto taking on Orlando. Number three, I definitely see a Boston-Philadelphia series in the works, though it is mention, worth mentioning that um, Ben Simmons, the 76ers star, is currently dealing with a patella injury, the severity of which is not yet determined, but he could be out for quite some time. And so I think that that might favor Boston over, say, a first round series with Miami. And speaking of the Heat, I think that Indiana has a real shot at locking up the number four seed and surpassing Miami, whom they would take on in a first round series. Out West, I definitely think, as we touched upon earlier, Portland has a lot of momentum right now. And I see a 1 8 matchup between the Lakers and Blazers. At number two, I see Denver taking on the Dallas Mavericks. Denver is playing quite well right now. And more importantly, the, my projected three seed, the Los Angeles Clippers, I think they're going to start resting their star players such as Kawhi and PG in these last few games. So I see them slipping to three and taking on the dangerous OKC Thunder at the sixth seed. And a 4-5 matchup between Utah-Houston would be a great series also. I think that could definitely be a toss-up between two teams with somewhat contrasting styles. Absolutely. When you talk about the four or five matchups in each conference, I'm very excited about not only Indiana versus Miami, like you mentioned before, the TJ Warren, Jimmy Butler feud. Oh, yeah. Will certainly be on the forefront there. But Utah and Houston in intrigues me as well. You know, these are two teams that have faced off in the playoffs the last two seasons, and third installment were, will uh, be just as good, I'm sure. So those are really two matchups I'm really looking forward to. So now let's get into something I've been looking forward to, and that is our picks for the 2019-2020 season awards. 
And we should note that officially votes are cast or have been cast based solely on players' performance prior to the NBA stoppage on March 11th. So though we see some play from Zion Williamson certainly turning heads thus far, he's technically not eligible um, for votes based off his bubble performance. So let's start off with the headliner, the MVP. Frankly, and I hate to say this, I don't think it's close. I think that for the second straight season, Giannis Antetokounmpo, who's averaging almost 30 points, 14 rebounds, and six assists for the number one team in the NBA, I think he has it locked up. And he's doing so in only 31 minutes per game, which is, for those who may not know, less than three quarters of NBA action, only two and a half quarters of minutes each game. And he simply makes players around him so much better. And most importantly, the development of his drive and kick game really reminds me of sort of 2012 to 2014 LeBron James in the Miami Heat, where he had shooters on every wing, every every corner. And really several similarities exist between those teams. When I look at Chris Middleton, I see a second star such as Dwayne Wade. This might be a stretch, but I see Brooke Lopez serving sort of a Chris Bosch type role for these Heat as the sharpshooting big can provide spacing as well as rim protection on the defensive end. And just one last note on Giannis and his season. He, in those 31 minutes per game, is putting up the fifth highest player efficiency rating ever. And the Bucks are the league's most dominant regular season team since the 73 and nine Warriors that we saw in 2015, 2016. So what are your thoughts on Giannis? I mean, I will say that LeBron James has continued to win his battle with father time. And this season he's, he's been able to dish out a career high 10.3 assists per game, which is more than a hundred assists above the next player, Trey Young, which I find absolutely remarkable. Uh, and, perhaps one of his greatest achievements in an all-time great career, at least top three in my eyes. I know there's plenty more to debate within that topic, but it's important to remember that LeBron James is playing alongside Anthony Davis, and uh, the Bucks are a team whose second options are nowhere near the talent of AD. He's a perennial uh, all-NBA talent. So I'm going to have to give the edge to Giannis. Like you said, the majority of the numbers make it very difficult to argue against him. Um, He's the best and most efficient player uh, on the league's best team. And his size and strength make him a matchup nightmare on offense and defense, night in and night out. And over the past three to four seasons, he's only gotten more and more polished as a scorer and distributor. So like you said, it's, it's not all that close, but I feel like we do have to give credit to LeBron James and what his 16th, 17th season in the NBA, just as good as he entered. Uh, and James Harden as well, who's putting up uh, an absurd 34 points per game. He leads the league in win shares. He's towards the top uh, in offensive win shares. So, you know, speaks to the level of talent in the NBA. But I think for the second straight year, Giannis rules them all and will take the MVP home. Yeah, and to your point on LeBron and Anthony Davis, it almost creates this dynamic in which the two superstars are splitting votes between them because LeBron, to your point, has really had an absurd year when you talk about the assists and all he's done in response to the groin injuries that kept him out of part of last season. But then Anthony Davis, you got to mention, he leads the team, if I'm not mistaken, in points, rebounds, steals, blocks, among a variety of advanced metrics. So really those two, it's almost as if they're competing with each other, whereas there is a certain reigning MVP out East who appears destined to bring home the award. And I must say that does bring me into my vote for defensive player of the year, Giannis Antetokounmpo. Only Michael Jordan and Hakeem Olajuwon have ever won both MVP and defensive player of the year in the same season, but the advanced metrics and simple eye tests just favor Antetokounmpo, who, in my opinion, is the greatest help side defender I have personally watched in several years. And again, going back to that team out West in the Lakers, Although Anthony Davis might have the edge in terms of rim protection and even blocks and steals numbers, Giannis is leading a historically effective Milwaukee defense in every way imaginable. And I think it's time for 
another player to win both awards in one season. That's how special I think this season has been for Giannis. A better time than 2020 for, for Giannis to become just the third player ever. So if you're with me on that, let's move on to rookie of the year. My pick for this is Ja Morant. And I know I mentioned Zion at the beginning of this, this segment. And though Zion has actually been the more dominant rookie since his return from injury, especially in the Orlando bubble, Ja Morant has really led a surprising Memphis team to being within reach of that eight seed in the playoffs at West. He's averaging almost 18 points and seven assists. And he reminds me of a rookie Derrick Rose based solely off his athleticism. The only difference, though, is that Rose shot just 22% from three-point range his rookie season, whereas Morant has already displayed a respectable three-point stroke, shooting 34% thus far, and something I can't imagine will go anywhere but up over the next several years. For sure. I think it's particularly hard to give someone who will have just played 27 games any sort of award, but in my opinion, if Zion Williamson did play full season, there's no doubt he would have walked home with the rookie of the year. He's probably the most explosive player that we've ever seen since LeBron James entered the league in 2003. That being said, I love the way John Morant plays, and I see him as a more than deserving alternative to win rookie of the year. I think outside of Morant and Zion Williamson, it's it was never a particularly close race. Uh, R.J. Barrett, who had very high hopes for the Knicks, uh, showed flashes, but I I think he appeared more raw than ready for the league. Um, he made a lot of mistakes defensively. He did shoot at a rather low clip, especially at the beginning of the season. And he may en end up being a bit of a disappointment, like a lot of players who have gone through the New York Knicks system. But um, aside from Morant's ungodly athleticism that you mentioned before, similar to Derrick Rose and his very smooth shooting touch, um, I see him as a very smart and savvy player for his age as well. It's highlighted by his excellent court vision. He's averaging over seven assists per game on a very young team. And to speak more on that, he's he did inherit a far less talented roster than Zion Williamson did. Um, and Morant's passing to go along with his you know, explosive scoring have made the Grizzlies a much better team for that and one with very realistic playoff aspirations as well. Definitely. And I just thought of this, Rob, in terms of the John Morant, Zion Williamson, Rookie of the Year debate, I would just encourage our listeners to think back to the 2017 Rookie of the Year race. And that was the year it was, it came down to Joel Embiid versus Malcolm Brogdon. And Brogdon, the Indiana Pacers guard, actually at that time, Milwaukee Bucks guard, he ran away with the award. And that was on account of Embiid, though having a historic rookie season, playing, I think it was right around 33 games on the year. So definitely, you know, you don't want to knock Zion for it, but at the same time, you got to knock Zion for it. Um, but credit to the Pelicans organization for sort of easing him along and considering their franchise's long-term outlook in the midst of all that. Yeah, to speak further on that, he did end up sitting out today's game today being Friday at the time of this recording. Um, and the Pelicans have struggled somewhat in the bubble so far. Uh, and it doesn't look like they'll be competing for the eighth or ninth seed over these next four games. So like you said, they're thinking in their best interest. They're thinking about their future. And they sat Zion this game, and I'm sure they'll sit him the next few games as well. Maybe to his um, anger and disappointment. I know he's been very vocal about wanting to play you know, a full 48 minutes for the Pelicans and give everything he has. But with a little bit of injury history in the NBA and in college, it's certainly fair for the Pelicans as an organization to worry about his health. I agree with you on that. But that's not to say that no Pelicans player has a shot at taking home some hardware this year. Because my personal pick for the most improved player of the season has to go to New Orleans forward Brandon Ingram. And a lot of people will and have argued that this award should go to Luka Doncic or Bam Adebayo, perhaps even Jason Tatum. But Ingram has a distinct edge over each of these players. For example, the award typically is not given to second-year players, despite how remarkable Luka's leap to superstardom has been this season. And I would argue, and many have argued, that Adebayo's progression, though also nearly as impressive has been fueled in large part by a simple increase in opportunity and minutes in Miami's rotation 
especially following the departure of Hassan Whiteside during the offseason, with whom Adebayo was splitting minutes. Ingram, on the other hand, had been given the opportunity for several years to be a starting forward in this league with the Lakers, yet he had failed up until the season to make the leap toward being an elite player. But now, the first time All-Star has certainly showed me that he can serve as a team's go-to score on the offensive end. He's averaging 24 a game on fairly efficient numbers, and simply he just seems more confident than ever before. He seems stronger and just more composed on that end. And going back to Zion, I wouldn't want to be any team out West having to deal with those two as a duo for the next several years. Absolutely. And I certainly wouldn't want to be any defender who gets in Zion's way, as a matter of fact. But um, I noticed that you mentioned Luka Doncic and his seemingly unprecedented leap from where he already was in his first year to where he is now in his second year. He already won Rookie of the Year the year before, but he seems to have gotten even better in year two. Uh, and that's almost been somewhat of a knock on his most improved player uh, prospects. You can make the same argument for a guy like Pascal Siakam, who really came into his own last year and proved to be the, the true second option on that Kawhi-led Raptors championship team. But in 2020, he's become the guy uh, for Nick Nurse and that team. And as we'll get into a little bit later, uh, the Raptors are – arguably just as good as they were last season when they won with Kawhi. So Luca and Pascal are really interesting uh, scenarios in which they've probably improved so much on their former selves who were solid players already that their improvement may be discounted uh, in favor of guys like Brandon Ingram who took multiple years to develop into the players that they are now. Yeah, absolutely, Rob. The only knock on Siakam would be the fact that he won the award one year ago, and I don't believe anyone has ever won it back-to-back. But really, it is a testament to the young star's upward trajectory thus far. So how about sixth man of the year? And this one is where it gets interesting, and there are a lot of different people that would tell you different things. But for sixth man of the year, I've got to go with Dennis Schroeder, the German guard on the Oklahoma City Thunder. A lot of people would make a case for Montrez Harrell of the Clippers, but the award has historically almost always gone to a guard. Since 2004, Lamar Odom has been the only forward to win. I think 2004, it was Antoine Jameson, if I'm not mistaken. mistaken. Um, And Lamar Odom as a player, even as a forward, his game was more perimeter oriented. So really, I think that this is a guards to lose. And Schroeder has served as a perfect scoring plug behind the defensive tandem of Chris Paul and Shea Gilgis-Alexander. And his 19 points per game have been pivotal pivotal in keeping the Thunder afloat in a stacked Western Conference. So coach of the year, and this one we have a couple of different thoughts on, but it's worth noting that to some extent we have a decent sense of where this award may indeed be headed as Mike Budenholzer of the Milwaukee Bucks and Billy Donovan of the Thunder have been voted co-coaches of the year by fellow NBA coaches. Now, this is not the official hardware awarded to an NBA coach at the end of the season. That would be known as the Red Auerbach Trophy. Yet, it does suggest that one of these two will more than likely take home the award. But I would present a strong argument on behalf of Nick Nurse of Toronto, I think that Nurse made a decent case for the award last year as a rookie head coach, even though he had players like Kawhi at his disposal. Um, But ultimately, he lost out to Budenholzer simply due to Milwaukee's number one record. This year, though, no Kawhi, no Danny Green, actually. And those are two starters, one of which was your finals MVP. But Nick Nurse has led the reigning NBA champion Raptors to an even better record than last year. We've seen Pascal Siakam and Fred Van Vliet continue to blossom under Nurse's system, and Nurse has really shown a willingness to think outside the box in terms of defensive schemes and late-game play calling. I think that he's much more deserving of the award than Coach Budenholzer and slightly more deserving than Billy Donovan in Oklahoma City. Sure, and Billy Donovan is my obvious choice from the West. He's re-energized a team that was written off from playoff contention as early as last summer when they traded Russell Westbrook and Paul George for an absolute King's ransom of picks, I think dating all the way to 2026. So they, they will 
be set for the future, but surprisingly, they seem to be set now. Chris Paul, Shai Gilgis Alexander, and like you mentioned before, Dennis Schroeder and company have done nothing but prove us wrong under Billy Donovan. And they could very realistically vault up to that fourth spot in the Western Conference by the end of the, the bubble games. Now in the East, I'm going to have to stay in agreement with you. And I looked towards another coach who lost a star in this past offseason and arguably made his team better in 2020, and that's Nick Nurse. Uh, and the Kawhi leonard list Toronto Raptors not only remaining one of the conference's elite teams, but also keeping in stride with the Bucks for most of the season. Guys have filled in when necessary, and they've taken on many new roles and responsibilities with Kawhi and Danny Green's departure. And I think Toronto is as primed as ever to defend their title. Yeah, I agree with you on that, Rob. And as mentioned during last week's episode, WCHC Sports co-chair Evan Crum recently had a chance to sit down virtually with Holy Cross men's basketball coach Brett Nelson for an interview, and that interview is coming to YouTube. Stay tuned to WCHC Sports 88.1 FM YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for information on how to view Evan's talk with Coach Nelson. So as you know, Aiden, the NBA hasn't been the only major sports league to resume the end of its regular season. The NHL recently implemented their own schedule aimed to narrow a field of 24 teams down to 16 who will ultimately compete in this year's Stanley Cup playoffs. The current format is really unprecedented in comparison um, to years past. We're seeing the top four teams from each conference at the time of the NHL's postponement play a round-robin schedule, which each of the four teams play each other once, uh, to determine the seeding for the playoff tournament. So for the Western Conference in the NHL, that would be the Vegas Golden Knights, St. Louis Blues, Dallas Stars, and the Colorado Avalanche. And in the Eastern Conference, you have the Boston Bruins, Tampa Bay Lightning, Philadelphia Flyers, and the Washington Capitals. Now, NHL fans, including myself, all understood that this new format would be nothing like we've ever seen before, but perhaps something that no one saw coming was the St. Louis Blues and the Boston Bruins, last year's Stanley Cup finalists and the number one seeds in their respective conferences before the 2020 lockdown, are both 0-2 right now in the NHL bubble as of Friday and can only go as high as the third seed in this round-robin format. And, you know, I know you talked about this a little bit before, Aiden, with the Los Angeles Lakers, but it brings up the idea, again, that hot first-place teams um, at the time of the COVID lockdown were most hurt by this season postponement. Their momentum approaching the postseason was stunted, and less successful teams have since had the opportunity to recoup, re-strategize, and get healthy. So meanwhile, you're seeing the Avalanche, the Knights, Flyers and the Lightning, all who are 2-0 and in this restart, leapfrog into the top two spots in the Western and Eastern Conference, putting them in a fantastic position to go on a deep postseason run. And you know, Rob, it's surprising, but at the same time, I think it makes a lot of sense because no matter the sport, professional athletes across the board have really expressed the sentiment that this is essentially a brand new season even though it's a resumed season. So after months off, it's incredibly difficult, as you mentioned, for a team like the Bruins to just pick up where they left off. And you're also right in saying that other teams have had the chance to rest up and get healthy. Um, And we're seeing that pay off with these surging NHL teams just climbing up the standings rapidly. But that said, it falls upon teams like the Bruins and the Blues to regroup and just remind people why they were the number one teams in the NHL prior to the stoppage. But I agree with you. It's a big shock for sure. And the number three or number four seed definitely isn't quite what these two teams had in mind. Yeah, big shock is the perfect way to describe um, the reaction of many Bruins and Blues fans alike. The Bruins had 100 points before the lockdown. They were primed to win the President's Trophy. They looked determined to avenge that Stanley Cup Finals loss from last year. But in their first two games in the bubble against Flyers and the Lightning, they, they look stale. And I think they're certainly going to have that on their mind as they enter the actual Stanley Cup playoffs, which will be determined 
from the next eight teams in each conference, seeds five through 12, they have not been guaranteed their own place in the postseason field just yet. So they have to earn their way in via the Stanley Cup qualifiers. Qualifiers consist of eight five-game series, four in the East, four in the West, with the winner of each series moving on to play one of the round-robin teams in the first round of the playoffs. And the qualifiers themselves themselves have produced their own fair share of drama with the Chicago Blackhawks and the Montreal Canadiens, the two lowest seeds in the entire tournament at the 12th seed, each dispatching their fifth-seeded opponents in four games out of five, the Edmonton Oilers and the Pittsburgh Penguins, respectively. And this was a rather remarkable turn of events. You saw two of the NHL's top talents in Oilers center Connor McDavid and Pittsburgh center Sidney Crosby bow out very early to largely inexperienced teams. And we've also gotten to see an incredible series between the Maple Leafs and the Blue Jackets with 3-0 leads being blown in back-to-back nights in game three and game four. Uh, Game three going to the Jackets, game four going to the Leafs. And a winner go home game five is scheduled for Saturday night. And at the time of this recording, we have the Canucks and the Wild battling out in a game four. That could potentially go five. So a really competitive series, really competitive series all around in the NHL. In many ways, it feels like a March Madness type of week for hockey fans. You get a full slate of four to five games every day and a lot of stronger teams getting upset. And it's, it's really been an electric return to sports, no doubt. Absolutely. And big time stuff from both the Blackhawks and Canadians. And frankly, Rob, though certainly confusing to many, I personally love what the NHL elected to do with this Stanley Cup qualifier, because you hear a lot about the importance of playoff experience in the development of young players. And Commissioner Gary Bettman seems to have kept this in mind in his role in developing the playoff format. Now, although not every team will ultimately make the real deal, the Stanley Cup, the qualifying round is a sort of playoff series in and of itself, seeing as it's a best of five series in which teams will ultimately have their backs against the wall, just as they would in the real playoff series. And I think it's going to give a lot of these young guys a valuable experience experience that they might not have had in an ordinary season. Absolutely, for sure. When you throw guys into a pressure cooker like that in a scenario where there's far less room for error than there would normally be in a postseason, you're going to have guys who shine through and and deliver really great performances for their teams. And we saw that this past week. Do you ever find yourself thinking about sports while spreading cream cheese on your bagel? Do your friends ever complain that all you talk about is sports? Most importantly, do you consider Bob Cousy and Tom Heinsohn to be the best two NBA players of all time? If your answer is yes to any of these questions, WCHC Sports has a place for you. For information on opportunities to broadcast, podcast, and everything in between, email wchcsports at g.holycross.edu today. Moving on to Major League Baseball, Aiden, we finally welcomed back the Miami Marlins to regular season play on Wednesday, marking their first game since July 26th. And despite not having played for almost two weeks and needing to trot out a largely different roster in accordance with the COVID-19 protocol, the Marlins have found stunning success. As a team with health, a healthy amount of minor league players forced to become core contributors, they've been 4-0 since returning to play and 6-0 overall on the season which leads the National League East. Even more impressive considering Miami lost 105 games last season, 98 the year before, and hasn't had a winning season since 2009. The great things from the Marlins, they actually found out they just won again, 4-3 against the New York Mets. That's the final score from New York. That was 7-1 since the turn And uh, you know, these are... We love sports sometimes. You get these great comeback stories and these wacky situations from teams like the Miami Marlins. And uh, I can't wait to see what they do for the rest of the season. It's, it's a nice little bright spot in what's been a shaky MLB season so far. I'm really glad the Marlins have been able to come back and play well. Well, definitely is impressive on their part. And the Marlins deserve a lot of credit for 
the way they responded because so much negative attention was cast upon them for their potential role in the MLB's first real hurdle to playing out this season. But as you mentioned, some of these minor league players have taken sort of a next man up approach to things and they're playing some good baseball as a result. And despite the franchise's struggles over the years, manager Don Mattingly actually just became the winningest Marlins manager of all time. And that seven and one start you mentioned included prior to tonight, actually through the six and one start, a plus nine run differential, which is certainly worth noting. You know, and it's funny that you mentioned Don Mattingly because I think even he was surprised that his team has responded so well in the midst of what was once a PR crisis to a very strong start for the Miami Marlins. Now, granted, it's still quite early for them, even in, this, in the midst of a shortened season, but they aren't the only team overachieving in baseball this season. The Colorado Rockies, a consensus last place team in the NL West going into the 2020 season, are first in their division at nine and three, even ahead of the World Series favorite Los Angeles Dodgers at the time of this recording. The Rockies are up four to three in the seventh, uh, and they're on their way to a 10 and three start. And time will tell if these usually underwhelming teams like the Marlins and the Rockies can find sustained success and really maintain this narrative. We've talked about this whole podcast about this unusual 2020 sports year being a year of the underdog. But, however, this news isn't all uplifting. Uh, as we heard, after dealing with their own bout of coronavirus cases and missing nine games as a result, the St. Louis Cardinals were ready to return to play yesterday uh, and start an accelerated stretch in which they play 55 games in 52 days, the first three coming against the Chicago Cubs this weekend. Yet, mere hours before the first pitch was thrown in St. Louis, an additional positive test creeped up, bringing the Cardinals total to eight players and six staff members per Ann Ryan of MLB.com. And thus, as yet another series is postponed, COVID continues to be a nagging problem for Major League Baseball scheduling, as well as the su success of teams affected. You know, a large part of a team's success this season will be contingent on their prevention and treatment of coronavirus, much like their usual management of injuries during normal seasons. You know, the old adage is the healthiest team wins, and that reigns true for a uh, world decimated by coronavirus. But now more than ever, player health is paramount if a team wishes to hoist the World Series trophy this fall. Yeah, you said it, Rob. Players and coaches' health as well as obviously all the involved in the organizations. It's certainly the number one priority, but you touched upon the scheduling nightmare that this pandemic is really creating for teams and the league. And the MLB has somehow managed to schedule thus far all postponed games to be completed by the end of September. But let's just think about this. This is not going to be easy. And as of today, 11 of the MLB's 30 teams have been affected by the rescheduling and the league has taken the approach of scheduling several seven inning double headers. So it's really going to be a grind for some of these teams to get all of these games out of the way in such limited time, but scheduling aside, walk me through on a brighter note, some of your standouts from the first couple of weeks of baseball. For sure. Throughout the first 15 or so games of the MLB season, uh, I point to the Yankees outfielder, Aaron judge as the standout performer bat. He's leading the majors uh, as of time of this recording with seven home runs, 17 RBIs. He leads the league in total bases with 36. He leads the league in slugging percentage at 837, which is just a remarkable number. Uh, and he leads the league in runs as well with 12. The 6'7", 280-pound judge hits six home runs in five games this past week is a very large reason, no pun intended, why the Yankees are top the American League East and look primed to win the American League and go to the World Series. There really seems to be no team standing in their way right now, especially when guys like Judge perform the way they're capable of. Now going to the mound, a Cleveland Indians pitcher Shane Bieber racked up 35 strikeouts in his first three starts 
leaving him just too short of Hall of Famer Nolan Ryan's all-time record of 37 in his first three starts of 1973. The All-Star Game MVP of last season, Shane Bieber, made a strong early case for the AL Cy Young Award, and he's looking to do more than just that. He's looking to power his team back into the postseason. Now let's get into our assists, fumbles, and what to watch for this next upcoming week. Sure, Rob. So my assist of the week goes neither to a player nor a particular team. I'm actually going to give it to the NBA itself as the league's Board of Governors and Players Association recently pledged $300 million over the next decade to create and support the first NBA foundation, which will aim to spur economic growth in the black community as part of the league's commitment to racial equality and social justice. And while I personally feel that the NBA has done really an admirable job in bringing social justice issues to the forefront thus far in its restart, some have questioned how the league plans to back its message with real action. And I think Wednesday's news on the NBA Foundation certainly appears a step in the right direction. Absolutely. And for my assist of the week, I've noticed many organizations in Major League Baseball have gotten very creative with filling their empty stadiums as cardboard cutouts of fans occupy thousands of bleacher seats across the country. But on top of that, multiple teams are using this as an opportunity to make donations to worthy causes. Fans can purchase cutouts of themselves to be placed in their team stadiums uh, with proceeds going to COVID-19 relief, like the Boston Red Sox are doing, or ALS research, like the Oakland Athletics are pledging themselves to. I think it's a real fun, innovative way to keep the fans engaged amidst a very quiet MLB season, unlike any other we've ever seen, while simultaneously improving tens of thousands of lives. I think it's a great job by the MLB and the organizations. It's really great to see. Definitely. It's sort of an even more innovative take on the NBA's version of this in which they feature these virtual fans basically video calling into arenas. And it's fun, but at the same time, it's great to see the MLB really using this um, for the greater good. So moving on to my fumble of the week. And boy, is this an unfortunate one. Without a doubt, my fumble of the week is Oakland Athletics bench coach Ryan Christensen, as following the Athletics 6-4 win over the Texas Rangers, Christensen was caught on camera appearing to make what resembled a Nazi salute before elbow bumping the team's players in the dugout. So naturally, both he and the team released statements thereafter, apologizing for his actions. And I firmly believe Christensen when he says that the gesture was inadvertently made as elbow bumping has become more common among athletes in response to the pandemic, but is still a relatively new phenomenon. But still, it was certainly a lack of awareness on the part of the 46-year-old coach who played several years in the MLB himself, and frankly, not a great look for the Oakland A's. My week's fumble highlights the growing rift between Major League Baseball Commissioner Rob Manfred and the players, as both sides have started to point fingers with regards to who is responsible for baseball's shaky start and response to COVID-19. In a recent interview with ESPN's Carl Ravitch, Manfred stated the importance of player responsibility amidst the pandemic and seemed to blame them for the league's shortcomings, saying, we are playing. The players need to be better but I'm not a quitter in general, and there's no reason to quit now. Some believe these comments were ultimately justified, as Miami Marlins' outbreak, uh, as we discussed earlier, was in part a result of an Atlanta nightclub visit by some of the players, which is clearly not the smartest move, given the times we're in right now. But others, however, believe Major League Baseball's COVID policies and responses have been structurally weak and potentially dangerous um, in a time where our country is facing so much uncertainty about public health. Definitely. And last but not least, let's move on to our players or teams to watch for this upcoming week or so. And for this week, I'm going to be keeping an eye on Damian Lillard and the Portland Trailblazers. Lillard had a brilliant outing last night and drained 11 three-pointers for 45 total points against a great Denver Nuggets defense. And in addition to Dame Dalla, 
good old Carmelo Anthony has turned some heads with some really clutch shooting down the stretch of close games. I've been impressed. And I've been even more impressed with center Yusuf Nurkic, who not only did he dunk on Nuggets rookie Bull Bull, but he's looked like one of the best centers in the entire league in his return from a really serious leg injury. The Trailblazers, though, have a tough week ahead of them with matchups beginning tomorrow against the Clippers and then shortly thereafter the Mavericks. But Dame and company have put the entire league on notice in their pursuit of the eighth seed out west. And in, the, in my mind, they're not going to settle for that ninth play-in spot. They, they're going for the eighth spot. I couldn't agree more. I think the Grizzlies are very cold right now, and Portland Trailblazers are peaking at just the right time. I think the return of Yusuf Nurkic um, is extremely important to that team. You saw how much they struggled this season without him, and now that he's back, they look like a completely new squad who are ready to make their way into the postseason. Now, I will be turning into the final two rounds of the 2020 PGA Championship this week, hosting at TPC Harding Park, right along the shore of Lake Merced in San Francisco. It's the first major championship of 2020. Obviously, we had the Masters, the US Open, the Open Championship in Europe canceled due to coronavirus. But with the PGA Championship and the first few rounds, the course played slightly easier on day one, Thursday, with 47 rounds under par than it did on day two with 43 rounds under par. And while more difficult pin locations on Friday, frustrated PGA regulars like Tiger Woods, Justin Thomas, and Bubba Watson, it proved beneficial for some lesser known golfers, especially Hao Tung Lee, the surprise leader at eight under going into the final two rounds. And of course, Brooks Kepka looking for his third straight PGA Championship win, his fifth major overall, lays not far behind at six under through the first 36 holes. So that's going to do it for us on episode two of the WCHC Sports Podcast. Today we talked basketball, baseball, hockey, and even Rob threw in a little bit of golf there at the end. Rob, any closing thoughts? I'd just like to say thanks for everyone who's listening. It's great to see the follower base grow day by day. We'll get there soon enough, but for now, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you guys episode three. Take care.